Welcome to the local campaign. We are live here at the Georgina uh, studios of Rogers TV. I'm your host, Paul Nichols, and I guess I'll do a little bit of moderating this evening. This is for the uh, part of uh, Rogers' ongoing commitment to important issues in our community, and it's a debate for the upcoming federal election uh, for York Simcoe. We are joined here tonight by three of the four candidates. One of the candidates, Mr. Vitali of the Green Party, was unable to make it to this evening, uh, to our event. Um, I'll introduce the candidates in a minute, but uh, just a quick review of what it is that we're going to do tonight. We're going to try and get to nine questions. I'll do my best to shepherd things along, but, you know, sometimes things get out of control. <laughs> Let's hope not, but that happens. The way it works is uh, I will ask a question, each candidate will have a one minute to answer, and then we will have an open forum. And that open forum will conclude at the end of two minutes and we'll carry on with the next question. As I said, I have nine questions to ask. Each candidate will have a, an opening uh, speech and a closing speech. And uh, we, uh, prior to the start of the show, uh, had a very sophisticated draw, and I'll introduce the candidates to you now on my left. Peter Van Loan, the Conservative Party, Sean Tanaka, the Liberal Party, and Sylvia Girl, the NDP Party. And now we're going to move to opening statements from the candidates, and they will be given in the order that I just introduced them. So we will start with Peter Van Loan of the Conservative Party. Peter. Thank you very much. Since being given the honor of representing York Simcoe, my priority has been to focus on improving the quality of life for local residents. Let's discuss some of those results. I'm proud of us having delivered for your Lake Simcoe's environment. We've done that with the Federal First, a cleanup fund that has now had over 200 projects funded to improve the quality of the lake and its surrounding ecosystem. We've also delivered a number of other measures, and there are already measurable improvements and results for that lake health, and we expect to see that improving for years and years to come. We've also delivered in terms of important local projects, things like the recreational outdoor complex, the rock with federal infrastructure money, a new covering for the Pefferla ice pad, improvements to parks and to local roads, and of course, the extension of the Highway 404 with federal money, which has helped to give people uh, less pressure in their lives and more quality time together with their families. But most important are the measures we've taken to lower taxes and help families get ahead. That's what I'm proud of for York Simcoe. Thank you. Next to speak will be Sean Tanaka of the Liberal Party. Great, thank you. So Canada is a great country and deserves better leadership. The Liberals have a detailed, sustainable and costed plan that will make urgent investments in the middle class and those striving to join it, and in things that will improve the quality of your life now. Uh, public transit, affordable housing, um, infrastructure, clean jobs and innovation. And we'll reduce the income tax uh, for the middle class by 7% so that more money goes back into your pockets. We'll also make a bigger automatic and tax-free child benefit contributions that won't be clawed back at tax time like the way that the plan that the Conservatives and the NDP are supporting. We'll also return the age of retirement pensions to 65 after the Conservatives have raised it to 67. It's clear that Mr. Harper's plan has failed. While middle-class Canadians struggle to make ends meet, uh, the Conservatives give billions in benefits to the wealthiest few, while we do nothing to help the average Canadians get ahead. After a decade of Stephen Harper, only Liberals are offering new leadership and a new plan Thank to you. deliver real change so that all people can succeed. Thank you. Next to speak, Sylvia Girl of the NDP Party. Thank you. Everyone knows, all of us know, the NDP has fair policies for seniors to help students, the mentally ill, families, and farmers. But we also have smart policies, like investing in infrastructure and transit, things the business community says will stimulate investment far more than tax cuts. We will diversify so Canada does not get stuck as an oil nation just in time for oil to lose value. The NDP is the only party making smart long-term decisions to strengthen this country. That's because we have strong MPs. You won't find many backbencher yes men and women just intelligent people standing up for Canadians and their communities. And I would be honoured if you would choose me to join them. And I'm going to try to convince you of that tonight. Thank you. Well, it's time for questions, folks. I hope you're ready. Now, I'm going to put my glasses on because, uh, well, there's a lot of words here. <laughs> the first question is called jobs, jobs, jobs. The most important part of economic strength is the workforce's ability to secure well-paying, 
long-term jobs. Despite offering a talented and well-educated workforce that's superior to many countries in the world, in a global economy, Canada has suffered and lost thousands of jobs. It seems current jobs are contract, short-term, or minimum wage jobs. What will your party do to bring jobs to Canada, and more specifically, if elected, what will you do to bring jobs to Georgina? The first person to speak with this issue will be Ms. Tanaka. Thank you. So one of the things that the Liberal Party is quite proud of is the $60 billion in infrastructure investments. And that's going to make sure that people get back to work and grow the economy. Um, that will also benefit places like Georgina in particular when we're looking at the 404 um, expansion as well as transit and different initiatives, social infrastructure as well. Um, the Liberal Party is also making sure that we invest in our youth and making sure that as a university professor that there's jobs upon graduation. And so we've uh, pledged to make 40,000 jobs each year uh, for the next four years, uh, for youth in particular, so that there's opportunities. Um, as well as making sure that there's jobs and skills training for the un unfortunate chance that you might lose your job. So I was at the Georgina Trades and Training Institute and we'll be making $750 million um, in skills training investment each year as well as $25 million to facilities like the GTTI um, and making sure that they're supported. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Girl. Um, Absolutely, infrastructure spending is vital, and the NDP pledges to $1.3 billion per year toward the huge deficit that actually exists in the crumbling roads and so on. But only having it, um, infrastructure spending on its own is not going to do enough to bring back those manufacturing jobs that have caused us so much loss in those well-paying jobs in Ontario, in particular in the audit, auto industry. But one thing that the NDP pledges to do is to champion manufacturing and also reward it here in Canada where value-added jobs are rare because we are an exporter largely of raw goods, raw materials, um, rather than just taking it out of the ground or chopping it down and, and selling that. We want to stimulate the, the smaller businesses that are actually the job creators, it's probably 78% of jobs by a reduction in small business fee and investing in youth. And innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Van Long. There's no doubt, uh, Paul, that we live in very challenging global economic times and the economy is changing. The way jobs are created and work operates is changing. But I'm very proud that through what has been the worst economic downturn of our time, my lifetime, uh, Canada's actually done relatively well when we compare ourselves with other similar developed economies. In fact, we had the strongest job creation record and we've delivered 1.3 million net new jobs since that downturn. So we're delivering them, but we need to do more. Our approach has been a low tax plan approach and it's worked. And it's in contrast to the other countries that have had trouble that have taken too much money out of their economy, have high debts and high deficits, and as a result, that kills job growth. We're going to continue on that low tax plan, and I'll give you just one illustration. A home renovation tax credit, a permanent one, is the kind of thing that we're proposing that will have a dynamic impact locally, where so many people are involved in trades and home renovation, where people can improve their own homes. It's in stark contrast with the kind of tax increases we see being proposed by the other parties. Thank you. Now it's open forum, so just weigh in at your own pleasure. I'd like to say that um, there comes a point at which lowering um, taxes for, for large corporations does not any longer stimulate the economy. We've been told that by business people. So, uh, and in fact, it's money stagnating. What we really need is a middle class that has a wage, enough disposable income that they can buy the things that can be made, that will be made. So, I mean, there are other countries all around the world, Italy and Greece, to name a couple of disastrous ones, that have tried that tax. And at one point, uh, up to a certain, down to a certain point, it works. And after that, it no longer works to stimulate the economy. So what I'm suggesting is that we have to invest now in, in innovation and green technology so we can actually become a world leader in that respect. And the 1.3 million jobs, uh, that seems to be a magically increasing number. It was, it was 180 million I read on a flyer, and now it's suddenly leaped. And I think they're using some sort of strange well, mathematics. What, what Sylvia is, is, is suggesting, I think especially when it comes to the manufacturing jobs, I think that we have an incumbent who had a seat at the table to represent Ontario to make sure that 
auto sector jobs, like many people in this riding are employed by, aren't being lost and aren't being uh, shipped out of the country or out of our riding. A lot of people in this community rely on those jobs and our MP has an obligation to make sure that those jobs are protected. But I would disagree with the NDP when it comes to raising corporate taxes. I think it's been clear and shown by economic ex experts that that will actually cost Absolutely jobs. Absolutely not. Not for the biggest ones. Jobs. They're not stimulating. The money they're sitting on will not stimulate new jobs until we have people I'm to not buy. Saying that, I'm saying the, the, fact it would the most important thing jobs. for our community are personal taxes, taxes on families, and small Small business taxes, because uh, so many of the people in our community are in employed in their own small businesses. We've reduced the small business tax rate from 12 to 11, and it's going down to 9 percent as a result of the last budget. Well Those well. are sure. the kinds of things Probably that put both. money into yeah. the local economy. We've got to move on. We We've got nine on. questions to try and get through here. The next question is topic: families and children. Societal equity and parity seem to be the foundation concerns in this election. The gap between the rich and the poor and the fact that the middle class that built this country is vanishing poses real risks to the very fabric of our society. What is the most important initiative of your party's platform to assist families and children? We're going to start with Ms. Girl. Well, the first thing that springs to mind is the $15 a day child care that we propose to institute immediately. Um, I can't remember the, the full number of spaces. I'm sorry, I wish I could say that, but it's in the platform of the number of childcare spaces we will create, which also creates local jobs. But I'd like to answer that more fundamentally, and that is that um, many of, ND, of the NDP policies will help families because as we have seen, the inequity between the rich and the poor continues to grow because wages have been stagnant and prices of goods have gone up. Addressing that from a, a variety of uh, angles is the most important thing. But because right now we have parents, both parents usually working, commuting from this riding, at least commuting long distances, we need to look at quality of life and child care at a reduced cost is one of the most important building blocks for prosperity. Okay, thank you. Mr. Van Loan. Our most initiative, uh, initiative of greatest importance has been leaving more money in the hands of families. We've done this through a series of measures, tax cuts and things like the universal child care benefit. We introduced $100 a month for children under six, now $160 a month, a new child care benefit for older children of $60 a month. And we've done it with other tax reductions, whether it be reducing the GST, increasing the basic personal exemption, introducing and then doubling a sports and fitness tax credit for kids' participation in sports, a similar tax credit for arts participation. These are things that allow families to get ahead, to spend their money on their own priorities. And that's the basic question you have to ask yourself. Who do you trust to do that? Put more money in your pockets. The party that delivered all those tax cuts and benefits or the parties that voted against them? And who do you trust to spend your money best for you? Is it best to send it to the government and let them decide what your priorities are? Or is it best that it stay in your pockets so you can choose your own priorities for your own future? We believe that you're the best person to make those decisions about how to improve your family's condition. Thank you. Ms. Tanaka. The uh, most important thing I think that the uh, Liberal Party is putting forward is a child um, benefit plan that is bigger, automatic and tax free. So the money that you will be getting is money that you can budget with. It's not something that you have to be clawed back at tax time the way the NDP and the Conservative Universal Child Care Benefit Plan is. It's something that when you receive that money, you're right, you get to decide as a family how you want to spend that money. And so because we aren't being you know, sending these checks to the wealthiest 1%, we can make sure that it's bigger and it's stronger and more money back into the pockets of low and middle income families. And so up to $533 per child in a particular family, depending on that need. Um, the other thing that we would be pushing forward is 7% tax break for those people in the middle class and those striving to join it. And so we're getting money back into the pockets of the people that need help in the difficult task of raising children. I have two boys myself. I understand that difficulty. Okay. Thank what, you. What liberals, Open forum. What the Liberals don't tell you about when they tell you about what they're going to do is about the tax increases and benefits they're going to take away. They're going to uh, deliver you a tax increase by removing the family income splitting that we've delivered. They're going to take away that universal child care benefit of $160 a month. They're going to take away the $60 a month uh, universal so child care benefit for the older children. Of the low and middle income families. families. 
they are going to take those things away. She didn't tell you about that with her plan, nor did she tell you about their plan to deliver a $1,000 a worker tax increase through the support for either an expanded Canada pension plan or the Ontario provincial pension plan that Kathleen Wynne is proposing. That's $1,000 of after-tax income at the margin that families can't afford. So if you ask yourself who's really delivering you tax uh, reductions, we're clear. Everybody gets lower taxes under a Conservative government. With the Liberals, it's taxes go up, taxes go down. Maybe you might be better off. Maybe you'll be worse off. They never put all the numbers together. By our count, you will be worse off in most cases. Is it my turn and of course, it's debts and deficits on top of that like to that are taxes for the future. <laughs> Okay, so I have a few things that I'd like to speak to that. So no, that is not the case that we are raising taxes on, on the families that need it. They will get more money back in their pockets and it'll be tax free. There's no mystery behind it. When they get a check, they know exactly what they can do with it. And in terms of the pension, I'm surprised that you bring that up. When the Conservative Party has raised the age of, of eligibility for retirement CPP to 67, when you yourself get to collect CPP, your, when you get to um, yourself get to take your pension at 65, so the rest of Canadians have to wait till 67, but you get to collect yours at 65. It doesn't seem fundamentally fair to me. And what I'd like to say is that what the Conservatives don't tell you is what sorts of services will be cut because of that extra $100, $500, $1,000 in your pocket. That gets eaten up very quickly by increased user fees, a ride to the hospital, because let's face it, if you're weak need enough not to be able to raise... Okay. We need to move on. Thank you. Okay. Question number three is about affordable housing. If you watch Politically Speaking here on Rogers plug from time to time. You know that I've talked to numerous guests about okay. affordable housing. It's one of the most fundamental requirements of a robust society. What is your party's position on a national housing policy and more specifically, what will you do to drive the creation of affordable housing units right here in Georgina? First to deal with this will be Peter Van Loon. Firstly, I'd like to talk a little bit about our track record, and we have delivered, we've delivered units of housing uh, for those who are most in need in Mount Albert, in Bradford, and right here in Georgina, where we just uh, opened the building on the Queensway at uh, uh, Church Street, which uh, of course has uh, a large number of units for uh, people that are in need. And we've also announced recently some more additional units being built. We've partnered with all kinds of organizations as well as the province and the municipality to do that. But our plan is one that actually focuses on individual families by giving them more opportunity to withdraw additional funds from an RRSP for a first-time home purchase. Uh, we're going to be expanding that. That's one of our proposals on top of what we had introduced previously. The new permanent home renovation tax credit will make a difference for families who want to buy a home that requires a little bit of improvement uh, to get ahead. That's another part of our plan. And we'll continue to do things like that that deliver for individual families because that's the best way that they can get into affordable housing themselves that meets their needs. Thank you. Ms. Tanaka. Every family deserves, every person deserves quality affordable housing. So that's why the Liberal Party will have a national housing strategy. That's something that the current federal government has walked away from any type of leadership role in. The Liberal Party will make sure that that's a priority. Um, in terms of the infrastructure investment, $20 billion in social infrastructure will include monies put towards affordable housing and a strategy that's not just for new home buyers, but as well as seniors. Seniors are um, in a situation where often they are growing out of their home or it doesn't meet their accessibility needs. And more often than not, I'm meeting people in the community when I'm knocking on doors that they want to be able to stay in the communities in which they've invested their time and their families in, but they're being priced out. And so when their housing needs change, they have to move out of the community that they've dedicated themselves to. And that's a shame because they're the ones that do the volunteer work, that make our communities have the strong history that it has. So we will be pushing forward a national housing strategy with $20 billion in social infrastructure. Thank you. Ms. Girl. Um, first of all, our commitment as the NDP has always been to affordable housing and we find now in this market um, many Canadians, millions of Canadians priced right out of owning a house, which is everyone's dream. So, I mean, again, I want to talk about wages being stagnant and so on. We want to encourage businesses to raise the minimum um, uh, wage in order to raise, ta uh, raise incomes again overall. But we will entrench into law Bill C-400, which is the Affordable Housing Act, 
and, and develop a national housing strategy that recognizes that we need to work with indigenous peoples as well as seniors and seniors groups um, to build 10,000 affordable and market rental units and to make sure that those um, funding deals that we have made with municipalities do not just end, but we will reinvest in them as well. Um, under the Liberals and Conservatives, Can Canada's national investment in housing has fallen 46 percent, okay. and we intend to remedy that. Thank you. And uh, now we'll have an opportunity to we go through for everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now it's open forum. Have at it. Well, I think it's great that they that the NDP are developing a plan for a national housing strategy, but it's the Liberals that have a national housing strategy um, being pushed uh, forward by our housing critic, Adam Vaughan. Um, the Liberal Party will also be taking an inventory of different federal lands and making sure that we can repurpose some of the properties that we that we have in order to be able to be used where there's the most pressing need. Yes, and as is usual, when the Liberals are running for election, they speak very much like the NDP. I mean, a lot of the platform sounds like it's taken right out of our book, and that is that is par for the course. And then when it comes time to governing, we're right back to abandoning your ideas and principles. And but the idea and right now is urgent need. And so it, we can't simply right. have a plan to have a plan. We need to have action. And it's the Liberal yep. Party that has that action. We we, actually we've have already been delivering on urgent need. With our national homelessness strategy, our approach has been to shift to housing first so that you get people with really urgent needs into housing, and then you can address their other complex needs, mental health, drug addiction, and otherwise. And that's a, a, an approach that we've taken. And it's in partnership with the provinces and with local housing authorities. But in terms of this community and helping families in this community, our new permanent home renovation tax credit will make a real difference to their lives, to the quality of the home they live in. It'll help them to make it a better place to live. And already we delivered a seniors, uh, sorry, not just for seniors, for anybody, a home renovation accessibility tax credit in our last budget. And that, of course, gives an opportunity to allow seniors and others to stay in their homes longer and meet their accessibility needs. What's amazing is that the other parties voted against that very worthy initiative. Co-ops work very well here, and we're going to invest $2 billion in new co-ops. Um, I believe that um, Georgina already has quite a lot of, that the northern part of the east side of this riding already has quite a lot of long-term care facilities, and we want to make sure that um, we have mixed housing as well, to make sure that people don't have to leave the communities that they lived in all their lives. Okay, thank you. Um, how much time do I have left in the, before the break uh, to this? Is Okay, we're going to move the questions around just a tad, and we're going to move on to Canada's role in the world. One of the more divisive issues is what Canada's role in the world should be. We spend 0.24% of gross domestic product on funding other countries in need. We spend a large chunk of money on our military and in return have earned worldwide praise for our peacekeeping efforts. These missions have all too serious consequences. What does your party feel Canada's role in the world should be going forward? First to answer this would be Ms. Tanaka. Well, I think that we have to make sure that we stick to our Canadian values, and that's one of being respected for fairness and peacekeeping and our role as humanitarian aid. So I believe that we need to make sure that we are supporting our troops, but we're also making sure that that's training and not necessarily in combat and focused on an unending and unfocused mission that we are currently in. I think that we need to make sure that we are uh, safeguarding Canadians, but not at the expense of uh, peacekeeping missions and humanitarian missions that we are well respected internationally for. We are not well. Res we are not known to be combative. We're not known to be um, uh, a military force because our role has been one of peacekeeping and humanitarianism. Thank you, Ms. Girl. A couple of things, and I think you may see this emerging as a theme tonight. Um, we would like to undo some of the damage done by the Conservatives when they unfunded many of the organizations that were doing a lot of good work overseas because they've decided they designated them as too political. So Oxfam was told that poverty reduction was too political to be funded. Um, the other is certainly about our, our um, missions. Uh, Overseas, right now, I mean, I'm going to be really clear. The NDP has said we will withdraw from the fight against at least the bombing mission 
because it is not a black and white issue over there. It is very messy. And some ground troops that were making, that were within reach of the ISIS capital were accidentally, I think, bombed by Turkey when Turkey joined us as an ally. So that's our first um, duty to our troops is to take care of their needs, their housing needs, their health needs, and bring them home. Thank you. Mr. Van Long. Our approach in this Conservative government has been to uh, approach foreign affairs, international relations from a very principled approach and to advance the values we believe in. And what are they? Freedom, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. And we've done that in an uncompromising fashion in a number of ways, which really respects the Canadian tradition. I heard uh, somebody say, combat isn't the Canadian tradition. Well, there were 66,566 Canadians who gave their lives in World War I fighting for freedom, and a number in exceeding 40,000 that did the same in World War II. We were there to save the world when the world needed us and defend the values of freedom, and that continues to be the Canadian way. And our government's been very proud to do our part, whether it be in Afghanistan and eliminating the al-Qaeda threat, or right now with the current ISIS mission to address that very dangerous terrorist threat to the West. Uh, it's critical that we do our share uh, on all aspects of foreign affairs, but do it from a principled perspective, not a go-along to get a long way, not a wishy-washy kind of way, but with clear principles the world can respect. Okay, open forum. How is defunding Kairos principled? I don't understand that. That was an ecumenical group. That was that a, a ton of churches, a di ton of different um, faith organizations working together overseas, and that was defunded by Stephen Harper's government. Um, frightening people isn't a useful way of of um, helping, like of of uh, supporting troops. All of us believe in freedom and democracy and human rights. All of us in Canada believe in that. And we all know it sometimes takes blowing something up to fight for a right, to stand up for a right. But Canada is known as a peacekeeper and we want to become a leader again. And I agree with what Sylvia is saying here. And, and I, th I find it interesting that my conservative friend has said it is our role to save the world. And yet when we see that haunting image of that boy on the beach, that the um, the call to action, the, everybody saw that need of a call to action and the Conservative Party did nothing. And so what we need is a party, is a leadership that will actually take the political will to make sure that something's happening when we're seeing dying women and children on the beaches, that we make sure that we make Canada the safe haven that it's known for, rather than going in and bombing as being one of the, the, the solutions to the problem, why not being the safe haven that we're known for? Again, well, let's, let's ask ourselves first, what is the problem? Why are we facing this refugee crisis? It's because there's a genocidal group named ISIS trying to eliminate anyone who's Christian, anyone who's Yazidi, anyone who doesn't share their particular strange, twisted approach to the Islamic faith. Yeah, so and they're, they're trying to kill them, to and they're stopped. fleeing for their lives, and that's why they must be stopped. Any solution has to have three parts, all of which our government is doing, accepting our fair of ref refugees, our fair share, while ensuring yeah. that we are protecting national share? security at the same time. What does the UN, and the UN and say we will not compromise that and use refugees. the approach of the other parties, which would allow 25,000 in here by Christmas. You can't do that without security checks. We have to protect Canadian security. Fine, but we've also provided to... support for camps uh, and those refugees in those camps at a level higher than any other country like us per capita. And we're also involved in the military mission because if you want to stop the refugee crisis, you have to give them the freedom to return to their homes and to eliminate the threat which is causing them to run for their lives. That's what Canadians do. They're also running because they're being bombed. That because they're, they're, they're where they live is in chaos. I mean, the UN. We aren't taking in nearly. We aren't doing nearly as much as we can. People on the ground in Syria are saying, if Canada were to send more experts, then we can process we, refugees gotta, quicker. Believe it or not, we're actually at the half. We're going to go and take two minutes to pay some bills and whatnot. This is the local campaign. I'm your host and moderator, Paul Nichols. We're going to be back in a few minutes with more questions for the candidates.
Welcome back to the local campaign here on Rogers TV. I'm your moderator and host, Paul Nichols. We have the uh, three of the four candidates uh, here this evening for live to air debate here in our Georgina studio. We'll go back to our questions where we left off. We've got, uh, I think, four more, five more to, to get through, and I know they're just chomping to get at the bit. Let's see. We'll call this funding your party's initiatives. One of the things I think people find frustrating is that each of the parties chirps about the other one's numbers and where they come from and that they're all not right. I would say it a different way, but not right. And, and I'm curious as what your party's specific plan is to fund the initiatives that you have. Very basic grassroots, take out that, put that in, you know, that kind of thing. And the first to deal with this will be uh, Ms. Girl. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry to have to put it this way, but it really is um, a fully costed platform that the details of which you'll have to look up for yourself because there is, but largely, let me say this, largely the funding is going to come from A, stopping the large subsidies to um, oil and gas companies and banks that don't need it, they're posting record profits, and closing many of the tax loopholes. So I'm going to call it progressive tax reform that the NDP is proposing in order to get the money for $15 a day daycare, um, a $15 federal minimum wage, which is for federal workers, um, and um, the transit uh, funding, the housing funding, and all of the other things that we've talked about tonight. So it's a fully costed platform and everyone can look up the details themselves. Okay, thank you. Mr. Van Rijn. Um, the NDP talk about uh, eliminating uh, subsidies to oil companies and banks, except for one problem, there are no such subsidies. We eliminated any oil, sub oil company subsidies, for example, when we became government back in 2006. So you're not going to get any money there. But from the Conservative side, what we can tell you is our track record is our track record. It shows you that we have been able to deliver on the promises we've made, and we've been able to deliver on balancing the budget, not just on the schedule we gave, but in fact, one year ahead of schedule. So the track record of the Conservative Party is clear, and you can count on that into the future. We will continue to deliver balanced budgets while delivering the tax reductions we've uh, committed to give it to Canadian families. Now, the difference is, from the other parties, you're both going to see from both of them uh, deficits. The Liberals, uh, Justin Trudeau's promising to have $10 billion a year deficits. By our count, they're going to be closer to 30 or $34 billion a year. And same from the NDP. And the problem is, this is not a time when we can afford to go into deficits like that. That would be too harmful to our economy. Thank you. Ms. Tanaka. So the Conservative government, or the Conservative government has their numbers wrong. It's the Liberal Party that will be investing $60 billion in uh, infrastructure investments, the biggest in Canadian history. And the way that we're able to do that is, it's true, being very open and transparent in saying that we will run a deficit, a modest deficit, for three years in order to build ambitiously, to kickstart the economy, to get people back to work, and to get more money back in the pockets of average middle-class Canadians and low-income Canadians. And so part of our way of also doing that is asking the wealthiest 1% to pay a little bit more so that people in the lower and middle income brackets can pay a little less. And so that will also help um, fuel the drivers of growth and put the money back where it belongs, which is in the average Canadian that's working harder than ever to get ahead um, but is struggling. And so they need that investment. They need that type of support from their government that they're not getting right now. Okay, open forum. Well, you know where the Liberals are going to get some of their money from. I really need some. They've shown it. They've told you they're going to take away income splitting. They're going to get you to fund their plans. They're going to take away the universal child care benefit. And they're going to hit you with that new pension plan tax, $1,000 a person. And you know what? On top of that, there's another $1,000 on the employer side. How many jobs do you think that's going to create? What employer wants to create a job when each new employee costs them an extra $2,000 off the top that they didn't anticipate okay, before? Like to that's going to hurt the economy. And on top, of that, the on top of that, they're not going to be able to, uh, to fund all their promises. They're still going to be running big, I need to big say, deficits. sometimes it's important to run on deficits. But our, because that is, is very controversial, we have costed out fully four years of where the money's coming from. Our large corporate tax rate is so low now that it's no longer stimulating the economy, and that's where the money's going to be coming from. I'm sorry if I said subsidies instead of low taxes, but that is where the money's coming from. 
And in terms of the income splitting, the income splitting benefits only 80, um, doesn't benefit 85% of the Canadian population. Only 15% of people will benefit from that, yet it will cost Canadians billions in dollars. It actually helps the richest people. It does. It stacks yeah. the deck at the top. And the, and the Liberal the Party seniors. will be making sure that with their child benefit plan that it's tax-free, that it's bigger, that it's not clawed back at tax time. So the pensions, quote-unquote, tax that you speak of is not a tax. It's money that goes back into Canadians. What's your, what's your and it's the I let are. you talk, Mr. Van Loon, so now it's my turn. And so the other thing about balanced budgets, you ha can rely on a Liberal Party to make sure that they will bring us back to a balanced budget when we've delivered 10 consecutive surpluses. And so we have a history of balancing budgets. And so you can trust innovation and you can trust investment. Yeah. That the, the liberal, liberal, liberals began liberal the platform cuts. is deficits the every year. Massive multi-billion dollar you deficits. You had eight consecutive and deficits with no plan, with no investment, with no investment in infrastructure. Obviously an interesting rabbit hole. <laughs> yes. What we're going to do is question number uh, six is all about specific riding issues. And uh, in your view, what are the unique issues facing our riding, York Simcoe, and specifically Georgina? Uh, and what plans do you have to deal with them? And the first to deal with this will be Peter Van Loan. Well, when I first ran, I always said our most important issue locally was Lake Simcoe's environment. We've delivered with the cleanup fund now two rounds of it, $60 million, and over 200 projects funded, and a number of other changes, banning phosphates and detergent, banning dumping of waste in lake water, mandatory rules to protect from uh, invasive species. All these things are making a difference for the environment. But the biggest difference for most families beyond that is their own personal condition. Are they going to have more money? in their pockets at the end of the day. And that's what we've been delivering on with consistent tax reductions that have been opposed by the other parties. They opposed our reduction of the GST. Why? They said it would take too much money out of government and it couldn't deliver the programs people relied on. Well, guess what? People can make better choices for themselves how to spend that money, and that's what they've been doing. And that's why we saw recently in a study last year that Canada has the best off middle class in the world. We think it can be better off, and we're going to continue to make it better off with more tax reductions in the future. Thank you. Ms. Tanaka? Well, I've been knocking on doors for almost a year now, and what I'm hearing that people want in this riding are, is infrastructure. They want to make sure that they have roads that get them back and forth to work, that make sure that they have a quality of life so that they can spend more time with their families and more time in their homes and not simply stuck in gridlock. Um, they also want to make sure that they have more money in their pockets and that they are supported by their government in raising their children. And so the Liberal Party will be making sure that they do get that with a more, uh, a bigger, automatic and tax-free child benefit so that they know exactly how much they're getting each month. Uh, the other thing is an investment in transit. They're finding that it's getting more and more difficult to go around our riding. Our riding is incredibly big and um, we're going to be quadrupling the investment in public transit and making sure that people can get around to different types of activities as, as well as to work. And so it's infrastructure, it's public transit, and it's money back in the pockets of families. Thank you. Ms. Girl? Um, in terms of the, the riding itself, of Georgina itself, I think probably the $15 a day daycare is going to make the most difference. When I go to doors, a lot of people aren't home during the day, and a lot of people have young children. Now, commuting is also a big issue for people without kids. Um, many people drive hours to work, so our many of the NDP policies will help with that. I mean, the... the um, improving infrastructure. I mean, the 404 coming north is terrific. It saves a few minutes on the drive, but really it brings as many problems as it, it solves in that um, this is now seen as a great place to have more development. I mean, this is set to be the be biggest growth area of Canada in the next 10 years. So making sure that we have stable funding for municipalities to keep up with the infrastructure needs and vastly improve transit and childcare, I think, is going to be uh, are going to be the biggest things for this riding. Thank you. Hold one forum. Well, I think that the child care, $15 child care is ambitious. I, I certainly um, would appreciate that as, as a parent, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's, it's, it's a reality. Um, oh, it's absolutely. requiring the provinces to match uh, an investment of $3.3 a year and making sure that they'd be willing to sign on to that. 
And it's been found that those childcare spaces of a child born today, it'll be eight years before they're able to have that childcare space. It's the be next put building block in so a civil society. I don't. I, I agree. I agree. The intention is there. Will we see it as a reality? No. Yes. I'll, I'll throw in my two cents worth on childcare. I think that in uh, 1993, 1997, uh, 2000, and 2004, each of those years in the election, the Liberals promised to Canadians a national child care program. It was never delivered. So they have credibility when they say it's too expensive, you can't do it. Agreed. They promised it and they discovered it and they did not deliver it. That's why we yeah. used a different approach. We used an approach of letting families decide how to meet their own child care needs and putting more money in their pockets for it. Except That's what the $160 a month universal child care benefit for children under six is all about. And that allows families to make those decisions for themselves. You don't that's understand something, the reality that's something of that the Liberal Party wants to take away do uh, from families I agree with and Mr. take Van away Lone. their opportunity to meet child care needs. I agree with Mr. Van Loan that you need to get more money back in the pockets. And I, and I also agree that they should be able to use the money how I they do. want. And so that means getting money back in the pockets, but not being clawed away back at tax time. That they should be able to be given it tax-free, that it's automatic, and you take out the mystery of it. It's not a bribe before an election. It's something that's in your pocket that you can decide how you want to use that, whether it's with, with child care or whether it's for just m making sure that their daily needs are met in with terms of getting food on the table. Because that's the reality too. It's not always about sports and fitness child. tax credits. It's sometimes literally about getting food on the table to families. Yeah. Okay. Next question. This is a, you got to know this is going to come out eventually. Senate reform. The people of Canada, I believe anyway, are still not satisfied with the resolution of the Senate issue. I know I'm not. Something needs to be done. Under your party's leadership, what will the approach be to once and for all deal with this unaccountable partisan institution? First to deal with this would be Ms. Tanaka. So one of the things that the Liberal Party is proposing with Senate reform is exactly that. It's reform. It's making sure that we take out the partisanship. Mr. Trudeau did more in one day than Harper did in eight, term, in eight years um, by removing the Liberal senators from the caucus and trying to take out the partnership, the partner, partisanship from that. What they're proposing with abolishing the Senate, that's not possible either. All the provinces are not going to sign off on that. That's unconstitutional. And so in order to be able to do that, they would need to have everybody sign up on that. And the smaller provinces aren't going to want to give up that type of representation. But I understand the need to want to abolish it because we are having someone like um, Mr. Harper assigning 59 senators into the Senate when he promised in 2006 and 2008 that he wouldn't assign a single one. And so we're seeing those promises being broken over and over again. So I understand the need for reform, but that's exactly what the Liberal Party will be delivering on. Thank you. Ms. Girl. Uh, I don't believe that anyone watching the show is, is not going to know what we're really talking about here. But just to make it really clear, I want to um, let people know that I read pieces of the Hansard, the daily record of what happens in the Senate and in the Parliament. And what, what I was shocked to find is that especially under um, Mr. Harper, the senators are really just rubber stamping whatever the conservatives are ramming through parliament. And I thought, and many people agree with this, that if the Senate is there, it's supposed to be a, a house of sober second thought. I mean, I heard senators just sputtering because they felt so helpless and, and useless. And so I think that the system itself needs to be changed. We have said that we want to abolish the Senate. The NDP has committed to that. But since it is going to have to need an opening of the Constitution, it can't simply be done, not easily. But now it's full of liberals and conservatives rubber stamping things and has become useless as a house of... Thank you. Mr. Van Loon. Earlier tonight I talked about uh, Canada's values being projecting freedom, democracy around the world. Yet we have, as half of our parliament, with the full authority to deal with all our laws and vote on all of them, a fundamentally undemocratic institution the Senate. It's appointed. The that's only right. democratic connection is by the government of the day. And that's a very thin uh, connection. It's unthinkable. There's no other country I can think of in the world that claims to be a, a serious democracy that has an institution like that. That's why we introduced legislation to try and have our senators elected 
so that Canadians could have a choice and we, they could be selected and appointed after being voted on by Canadians. Unfortunately, that was resisted by the other parties. I was Minister of Democratic Reform, couldn't get it through, the other parties wouldn't allow that change to happen. Then we had an alternate approach, which was abolishing it. Both of those ultimately were referred to the Supreme Court because we were being challenged by provinces. The court said we couldn't do that without the consent of the provinces. So right now, the ball in this court, sadly, is in the hands of the provinces, and that's our approach. Uh, the Prime Minister will not appoint new senators until the provinces take some action to help us reform okay. the Senate. Thank you. Open season. He said now that he won't appoint any more senators, but not before, before appointing more than... He, he said he wouldn't appoint any, and he's appointed more than any other prime minister And I think it's interesting that, that Mr. Van Loan had talked about before, about Canada being a country that is a rule of law, and yet we're seeing our prime minister trying to contest that over and over again by changing constitutional things like our Senate. And so I understand why there's a need for demo democratic reform when we're having senators like Duffy and people in there that have a certain level of entitlement that we are now getting uh, witness to in the media and yeah. we're seeing exactly the type of shenanigans yeah, that go on. You can't on. speak of entitlement without thinking of the Liberals. I'm sorry. It's this once, once you're entrenched, that's going to happen. I'm really glad to have this chance to talk about the system because I think that our parliamentary system is shared by three other countries in the world, the U.S. Oh, many more than that. But, more but complicated in the U.S. and Canadians India. But this essential an undemocratic voting Senate. system. They don't accept it. They want to see change. And it would help yes, if the other do. parties would agree with that. Abolition is one it of our alternatives. Would help if we push but reform is another if we could elect them. And every time a senator I has been elected by the voters of a province, uh, our Conservative government has appointed that elected senator. And when the Liberals talk about Justin Trudeau having reformed the Senate, well, changing them from Liberal senators to Senate Liberals is hardly a reform. If Parliament That's the kind of smoke and mirrors well, that we've gotten used to from the Liberal Party no, the pretending smoke and to do things is that when we're they trying don't. to have openness and transparency, and what we're used to now is a government that is secretive and that is self-serving. And we, our, our objective as a Liberal Party is to serve the public. That's the whole role of a Member of Parliament, is to serve your public. It's not about entitlement. It's not about complacency. It's not about changing our democratic system and changing our Senate and changing the actual well, foundation yes, of Canadian senators values. are not accountable to voters, who do they serve? We have all exactly. agreed. That's the problem. Who do they serve, they sir? Because that's the other thing. The, the person we all that agree that's why the Senate fun, is fundraising for our okay, Prime Minister. Okay, we've got to move on. <laughs> Thank you. That's a spirited debate. I, we can go for hours on that, I'm sure. Uh, we're just going to go down a different rabbit hole, same idea. Election reform. Many people have expressed contempt with the first-past-the-post system of electing MPs in Canada. They correctly assert that such a system allows for potentially skewed parliament. Mm -hmm. What is your party's opinion of this, and what would be its strategy to change this system? First to speak to the, this will be Ms. Girl. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this because the NDP is firmly committed to bringing in multi, um, mixed member proportional representation. It's a system that has been used successfully in many countries. Some countries used a different form of proportional representation and then chose to change to this one. So I think it's fundamentally unfair when a government runs on less than 40%, has a majority with less than 40% of the popular vote. So 40% of, 60% of Canadians can vote against the ones that end up running the place. And the way that this last parliament has behaved has illustrated some of the greatest dangers in it because we've had no recourse in stopping huge omnibus bills, hiding tons of damaging things and um, we have a firm commitment to bring in proportional representation. Thank you. Mr. Van Loon. You know, uh, a lot of academics make a great career of uh, coming up with new electoral systems. I'm actually uh, pretty impressed with the system we have. I think it works. We have one of the longest running constitutions in the world, one of the longest running democracies in the world, arguably the best country in the world. I think that these are actually related. Part of our system, part of its strength, is that it allows for each member of parliament to be accountable to individual voters. They represent part of this country. They are accountable to the voters 
of that particular area. It helps bring the country together. It creates a force where when those people then come together in caucus, they speak about the people for whom they represent, the communities they represent. And I think Canadians agree with us because there have been several referendums, including one right here in this province of Ontario, where they've put forward other approaches, other legislative systems and those suggestions, and voters have consistently rejected those time and time again. And I think that they are demonstrating that they believe that this is a pretty good country. Democracy works pretty well here, whether we win or lose under the system. What it creates are stable governments that can make decisions and get things done and keep the country together. Thank you. Ms. Tanaka. Well, with the current system and the so-called Fair Elections Act, we're disenfranchising people. I agree with um, with Sylvia that I think that electoral reform is necessary, that this would be uh, the Liberal government's last um, uh, say in a, in a first-past-the-post um, type of election. We would be committing ourselves to passing legislation if we were to form government within 18 months to make sure that that's not the case. We would also be um, meeting with experts and, and the academics that, uh, that he begrudgingly uh, speaks of to talk about ways that we could do that to engage people that aren't voting right now, whether that's being able to vote online, whether or not that's mixed proportion, or whether or not that's another way uh, of voting but making sure that the votes count. Every vote should count. And so we need to make sure that we're making it as easy as Canadian, on Canadians as possible. Of course it doesn't suit the current, uh, the current government to change that. Um, if we enfranchise the people that haven't had a voice, I think we'll start seeing very, very different elections, particularly in this riding. Okay. The Liberals yes. want to meet with experts, talk to them about what system to have, and yes. then pass a law we to implement the to. system. Those aren't the people they should be talking to. It's ordinary Canadians. That's you should exactly not right. make a fundamental like to change something. to our system without putting it to a vote of the electors. And there should be a when, referendum when, to have any change in the system. The Liberals refuse to agree to that. And that's because any time it's been put to the voters, they have rejected it. And that's a reason why people should be concerned about fine. that aspect of the hidden agenda the Conservatives of the Liberal it more Party. It's more difficult for people to be able to vote. That's just plain and simple. Importantly, and if we have progressive people voting, then they're not going to be voting for a Conservative government. They're going to be voting for change. Importantly, when, when Ontarians were asked whether they wanted proportional representation, those that, that marked no were asked in a survey afterwards why they marked it no, and it's because they didn't understand. It is easy to teach people okay. what it means, and I think we'll see far more people voting. Okay, thank you. That's the end of our questions, folks. We're coming back now for the closing statement. And we started with Peter. We're going to start on this with uh, Ms. Girl. This is your closing statement. Oh, sorry. I'm, I was wandering off in my head. <laughs> I'm sorry. I do that a fair amount of time. Um, in this election, Canadians for the first time have three real choices in a neck and neck race. You can choose the conservative, us and them tactics, using fear and terror to manipulate you, and their obsession with tax cuts that mean even effective and efficient, and programs that save you money are cut. Or you can vote for liberals again. Sure, their platform sounds quite NDP. It's an election after all. But just six months ago, they were voting with the conservatives, abandoning their policies. I have always fought for fairness. NDP principles and plans do not waver. I'm ready to be your ear in New York Simcoe and your voice in Ottawa. Which party do you think really stands for progress and change? In a three-way race, there is no need for strategic voting. This time, choose what you have always wanted, the Canada you want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Girl. Ms. Tanaka. Sure. This election is about our future, and Canadians know that better is always possible. My conservative, my conservative incumbent runs on the slogan, change for the better. But I ask you, where's the change? Where's the better? A Liberal government will put more money in, the po in your pockets by cutting income tax for the middle class by 7%. They will also be putting more money in the pockets of Canadian families by producing a new Child Canada Benefit Plan that will be tax-free, that will be bigger, and that will be automatic. We'll also invest in seniors by returning the retirement age back to 65, since the Conservatives raised it to 67. We'll also have a national housing strategy where seniors and all people can find affordable quality homes in their community. After a decade of Stephen Harper, only the Liberals are offering new leadership and a new plan that will deliver real change so all Canadians can succeed. I ask you to vote for Sean Tanaka and the Liberal Party on October 19th. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. I Kevin. want to thank the other candidates for participating. It's tough being a candidate in an election, I know, and uh, they're showing a great commitment to their community. Uh, I think there's a clear choice in this election. It's a choice between our path, which is a low-tax approach that has delivered balanced budgets and ensured that our Canadian economy has managed to weather what have been very difficult storms in an uncertain global environment. And on the other hand, you have a liberal choice, which is a path of tax hikes, a thousand-dollar increase on the average worker on their payroll taxes, eliminating universal child care benefits, eliminating income splitting, yet at the same time an admission that they're going to run massive multi-billion dollar deficits. That approach will be harmful to individual family economies. It will be harmful to the Canadian economy. It will be harmful to the York Simcoe economy. So it's an easy choice, a choice between lower taxes and balanced budgets with the Conservatives, higher taxes and reckless economic choices and deficits with the other parties. I encourage you to follow that low tax plan for a prosperous future for continued economic growth and prosperity here in York Simcoe in Canada. Thank you very much to the candidates for putting our names forward for election and for taking part in the uh, debate tonight. Uh, I've always said to our guests, for the people out there in the audience, this is the fastest hour in television. Do you want to know that? On election night, October 19th, you can join uh, Rogers TV for GTA Votes 2015. Coverage starts at 9 p.m. Let's have fun. Let's all go and vote. Let's campaign. And good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.